It is the most remarkable place. You know, people wonder why would you want to live so close to a, an active volcano. It's a beautiful paradise here, but it's so ephemeral because it's obvious that it, it could all change in a moment's notice. We've been through eruptions before, but this one was different. We were a little in shock that it came out of the ground in our subdivision, right in the middle of people's lots, you know? We did not know this was coming. This was uh, way beyond what anybody expected. It turned out to be the greatest eruption in over 200 years. We knew that families were never going to be able to go back home. This is not like a flood that you can clean up and rebuild. Homes are lost. We lost over 700 homes. I lost my school and I got um, virtually no help. We, we lost this, this beautiful area and our lifestyle that we had for 25 years. All of this crazy summer we had last year really started on April 30th. Kilauea volcano erupted at that time from two different locations here at the summit, which was active since 2008, and also about 11 miles away from here in the east rift zone of Kilauea volcano, the Pu'u'u'u vent. That particular eruption has been going nonstop since 1983. Kilauea volcano rises from 18,000 feet below the surface of the water to rise up 4,000 feet above the water. This is the top of a 22,000 foot active volcano. Down beneath the summit, about two and a half miles below, is a magma reservoir within the volcano. Now that magma reservoir is not just a big pool of molten lava. It's little pockets, but it's rocks within that. As the pressure builds up in a magma reservoir, it not only pushes up on the summit, but it forces the sides of the volcano apart and opens up one of the two weak zones out either flank. They're called rift zones. So in April of 2018, Pu'u'u'u collapsed. A giant pink cloud came out of the volcano and it just signaled that something was happening. It's like they pulled a plug and the lava lake just plummeted down deeper and deeper and deeper and out of sight. Well, we didn't know what to really make of it. You could see all the rock falls and hear them start to crumble into this part of the volcano. The magma that was in the column that had been overflowing onto the floor of Halema'uma'u started draining back down into the earth. And that lava that was once, this lava pond that used to be able to see, was now gone. But the collapse of Pu'u'u'u allowed magma to move underground more freely. And so you would feel these, um, what felt like earthquakes. And they were, there were several a day that were in the magnitude of, of around 5.2, and then hundreds of smaller ones. You know, it, it's not a normal thing to feel 40 earthquakes a day or to be woken up at you know, 3 in the morning by a 5.3 earthquake every morning. 
we have more earthquakes in one year than you have in a hundred years. When the earthquake started happening, which was the first thing that happened, and that's when you see all the, you know, the ground and the cracks opening and everything, I felt this rumbling and this noise underneath me. But then the biggest one struck on May 4th. We felt it so strongly. It was a 6.9 magnitude earthquake. This one was a little different. People were starting to get nervous. People that had been here their whole lives were getting nervous, which made me nervous. Magma moved downrift or east of the Puo vent, more towards populated areas. Everything, you know, under the pink has been forever changed. Once that magma stopped moving underground, it erupted via fissures on the surface. But if it, it seemed to happen really fast. All of a sudden, ground was cracking, steam was coming up in Leilani Estates and in other places, and nobody knew what was going to happen. Where it was weakest, the, the lava popped up. So fissure one, it popped up. There's 22 fissures. And fissure eight, I think, was where the ground was the weakest, and, and boom. started screaming, get out, get out. Get out, get out, and you have 20 minutes. Get out, get out. And I was really not prepared. I had a few things packed, but 20 minutes was precious little time. We were sure that our house was gone, and it was basically from the channelized flow uh, from Fissure 8 that took not only our place, but also the entire neighborhood of Kapoho was just gone. The house I was living in um, that we built from the ground up uh, was taken, covered by about 30 feet of lava in five minutes. While this eruptive activity that was going on, I knew that Pele was remodeling, reshaping, revisioning her crater and caldera home. They might feel it without knowing it, but that would be Pele, Pele Honuamea, the Hawaiian volcano goddess. Her home is Hale Ma'oma'o crater. You know, everyone that lives here for a period of time becomes familiar with Hawaiian culture and tries to understand what is meant by Pele. Pele was an immigrant here. She came down the Hawaiian Islands and finally made her home in Hale Ma'uma'u Crater. Pele became deified because of the power that she demonstrated over the volcano and volcanic eruptions. Our park visitors often ask me, do people still believe in Pele? And I go, it's not a matter of still. People never did stop believing in Pele. Pele is like a, a personification because Pele is everywhere and in everything. This is a picture of Pele, a fire goddess. If you have anything in you, you will see what some of the Hawaiians point out to me. This is nature in their eyes. A creator, you will see a symbol of a person giving birth. You will see gentleness, you will see warmth, you will see kindness. Nature is not destructive. It is also mankind who paint nature as destructive. The Hawaiians know better. People who were born and brought up here saw themselves as guests of Pele. This is Pele's home. She's the goddess. She was allowing them to live here. Before we left, we made sure we mowed the yard, we cleaned the house, made sure everything was ready for her when she came. We had, um, it was a bottle of gin, and because that's her drink, you know, and other little things that we felt that would be good for her. And we did prayers, and we left a little sign on the house that said, be safe house. And they left in peace. So they have no argument with Pele. It's always a blessing when we have her presence, yeah? That's why we dance and we do different chants to honor her every time she's, she's blessed or she shows presence. I know some people there, some people particularly the deep Hawaiian culture, see it that way. 
you know, for me, I'm not quite there yet. I, I think some people are kind of denying to some degree how negative an impact it really did have on their life so they could live in Hawaii. How do I feel about Pele taking my house? I mean, I'm a, I mean, it, it happens, but I mean, when you compound everything else on top of that, you know, uh, where my, I'm just angry. I can't believe it's gone. I, I miss my life. I feel like I'm living, I'm living someone else's life right now. That's really how it feels. To call it a disaster is actually very disrespectful because to them this wasn't, you know, I mean, it, it's hard because when people lose their homes and they lose their material possessions, you don't want to, you don't want to negate the value of that or that experience to them. I think the disconnect is that, you know, people that come from America and other places, they feel like they own their land and they feel like they own their property and the Hawaiians have never owned anything. They're, they're the caretakers. For the... Hawaiian culture, this is normal. I mean, this is something that's happened in the past, that the mindset in Hawaii is that land owns people and people don't actually own land. So the land can change by its own right, its own spirit, its own energy, and people just move out of the way and then come back when it's time, when it's ready. Like other native peoples, they know that they're the caretakers and that whatever they're given while they're here, they're really respectful and grateful for. There's a variety of reactions to the eruption. There are from the native Hawaiians who have been living copacetically with the volcano for 2,000 years and have a more accepting quality, like, you know, this is something we need to get out of the way and, and a recognition that there's a lot of blessings that come. That's how the islands were built, is through volcanic activity. On the one hand, to the most recent arrivals, who are a lot of baby boomers, who have not had a lot of time for acculturation. They've come in the last five, six years, bought houses, want to have their retirement, maybe don't know that much about Hawaii, haven't had exposure to Native Hawaiians unless they happen to see them playing in the bar at the hotel or serving them a drink at the, the golf club or something. And so you have those people who've come with that kind of more starkly ignorant Western view of nature. And then you have everything in between. So you have the Hawaiians who actually have a reverential attitude toward these powerful natural forces, particularly Pele and the volcano, and those who feel affronted. Like, why is this happening? During this eruption, it destroyed over 700 structures and buried over 13.7 square miles. But it also created over 875 acres of new land. You know, it's the only form of a natural disaster that actually creates. I mean, it destroys, but yet it's, it's the Earth's way of giving birth to new land. And so you're watching destruction and creation at the same time. And I think that was one of the things that really impacted me was the shock of knowing that in some cases that you'd be standing somewhere that would be the last time anybody would ever stand there. The big difference about living here as opposed to living someplace on the continent where there are hurricanes or tornadoes. All of that still leaves the land intact. Houses and roads and farmland and what, whatever may all get washed away, but the land is still there. Here, everything is covered, everything. And it's covered 100 feet, 150 feet deep with solid rock. So you can't really go back. We used to get very excited and celebrate when the lava would hit the ocean because we were growing. It was, it was creation, it was growing. You know, on the one hand, I think we all witnessed 
one of the greatest events that we really could have. Um, the forces of nature that are so much larger than any of us or anything that mankind can bring to bear. Again, the community will never be the same, but it, it can move forward in very positive ways. There's nothing but opportunities in front of us. People that live here know that this is a very adaptive and changing environment anyway. Um, the fact that we choose to live on an active volcano um, gives us that already we have that kind of instilled in our values that what we see today might not be what we see tomorrow. Just because the lava ain't calm, life doesn't stop. You gotta keep on going. I know it's a whole devastation kind of thing for a lot of people because they're their houses, their lands got covered and whatnot. But at least we was here to show the people that keep on going in life. Nothing is permanent. Everything can go away like that. And um, it showed us beauty and destruction at the same time. It showed us where people can come together. I'm not saying that losing what we had was easy, but understanding what what really is you know we have creation and we have what was in the past right right in front of us so so that's a big learning experience and um, I think that's what we all gain from it is is what what it's like to live in this world you know Hawaiian means I was born here. I am of the island. I am of the land. People around here, first of all, if they're native Hawaiians and of that culture, they're very familiar with volcanic eruptions and they're very used to it. Uh, spirit of aloha, help each other out, and there's been a whole lot of that. Community, of course, has been uh, traumatized and individuals have lost everything. And or lost most of what they have, uh, including their homes. So, uh, you know, I, I take very seriously my role in trying to be sure that they get as many resources as possible. The county did establish um, shelters, temporary shelters for people in need. So many families took family members in or even sometimes perfect strangers into their home and gave them shelter. But as we proceeded, we knew that families were never going to be able to go back home. This is not like a flood that you can clean up and rebuild. Homes are lost. We lost over 700 homes. The community wanted to really rally. So some of the social service agencies and our faith-based groups got together and said, let's build some tiny homes as interim housing for folks. Now that I'm working on the county side of things and I'm trying to support the county's role in recovery, I see that there's a rebuilding of trust and communication and collaboration that needs to happen with the community and local government. For the most part, the responders, all of them from federal, state, county, and private, did an outstanding job. It's a simple fact that we've had only two known injuries. Everybody that came down to assist us, especially nationwide, you know, is, you know like, they were amazed at, you know, the response that we had to go through. They helped the way they know how to help FEMA and Red Cross and all those companies. They did help people, but they also don't know how to help people the way the Hawaiians know how to help people. The Hawaiians come from their heart. They know that you, people need food. They need a place to sleep. They need to feel safe and they need to feel like they're at home wherever they are. Community is life on an island. That's what you have, um, especially if you live on a rock in the middle of the ocean, 2,500 miles from anywhere. Before this event, I didn't know what it meant. I didn't know what it meant, for example, to sleep in a shelter, you know. So to have that experience has really humbled me. There was that thing that happens in communities that's faced with a crisis of some sort or anxiety. We pulled together. So, you know, instead of just kind of waving people at the post office, you took time. How are you doing? What's happening at your place? You took time with each other in a way that, uh, it, more than usual, this is a close community, but it became very much closer. People were teaming up, you know, getting groups of people together, showing up with pickup trucks to come 
grab your things if you knew your house was going to be taken. I was there for the ocean entries when they first happened, some of which I was the only person there. So I got to really enjoy the beauty and the destruction as much as we're, we're sad for that, you know, with all due respect to the people who have lost stuff. So I'd say culturally, you know, you got to see the evil side of humanity where you have people doing wrong things or trampling on people's property for access or you know, trying to monetize access on somebody's property. And then you had the good part of humanity where you had people helping each other and helping evacuate and keeping information going and, you know, assisting going back into Ground Zero even after homes were covered in flames and gases to try to save some last minute things. What we saw was that the community had been shattered and they had been scattered because of the need to find housing anywhere they could. But coming together at the Wailoa Center was definitely an experience for them where I saw a community that came alive. Even talking about it, I can feel the feelings come back up. It, it was a day-to-day -day giant question mark. What's going to happen? Where are all these people going to go? What's going to happen for us personally? What's going to happen to our business? What's going to happen to our community? So the community was providing relief. They were providing uh, assistance in terms of psychological needs. They were providing the tents that people now needed to sleep in. They were providing the, everything in between. So it's the way it shows the world is really, we are all together here. So that's, that was most empowering. I think a newcomer to anywhere in Hawaii will immediately realize that we are a melting pot of many cultures. And if there's any one thing that brings everybody together is the sense of family. Even though some of us may not have Hawaiian blood, Ohana Wahana here, it is our kuleana. Some of your roots may be a few inches deep, some all the way to the liquid hot magma. Nonetheless, we all have a kuleana. particular oli ties you to this place. It's a welcoming chant and it's sharing this place and this environment with aloha. A kupuna once told me that you have to be proud of who you are, all of who you are, because it's what makes you special. Well, it took me many years to get to the point where I was proud of who I was. Hawaiians feel the very future of Hawaiians as a people depends on uh, the preservation of Hawaiian culture. The whole government structure of the territory of Hawaii, the Republic of Hawaii, was to downplay the people of Hawaiian heritage. They even made a law in 1896 or so, a couple of years after they took over that there will be no Hawaiians of any Hawaiian language used to teach the Hawaiian people anything. So the Hawaiians are fighting for survival. They're fighting to gain some of the things that they lost because the culture was taken away. The language was taken away. And if you lose your language, you've lost your culture. And can you imagine being born and raised of this heritage for hundreds of years that say, from here on in, you will even speak Hawaiian. There will be no teaching of your history. If you don't have history then taught, you do not teach truth. What a lot of Americans don't realize is that Hawaii has a long colonial history. And that colonial attitude still prevails in many ways today of this place called Hawaii, Hawaiian Islands, was governed by the monarchy of the Hawaiian people. In 1893, a very small handful of people from elsewhere looked at this place and decided we want to own this place of government. And they overthrew the Hawaiian monarchy of Queen Liliuokalani. They did it with the help of United States Marines because 
The United States was interested in Hawaii primarily as a military outpost. They wanted Pearl Harbor. And Theodore Roosevelt was big on that. The Congress refused to undo it. The result of that was the complete change from a constitutional monarchy to a colonial uh, extension of the United States. Just imagine that if you were Hawaiians at this time. From your own government, overthrow, to annex into the United States with no documentation of an agreement of any kind or the people involvement, just as few power people. And from 1898 to 1959, we were a territory of the United States of America. I think when, when Dr. Martin Luther King came to Hawaii, right after it became a state, he saw with his own eyes the future and said so. I have seen the future here in Hawaii. Because if you live on an island, you can't be making enemies with everybody. You have to find a way to take the best of all the cultures that are there, which include here Western culture, Asian culture, Polynesian culture. When he was here, he met a native Hawaiian minister, Reverend Akaka who then made sure that when King went to Selma, he made sure that King and his leadership group all had Hawaiian leis as a symbol of peaceful intentions and love. One of the reasons people wear vegetation one of the reasons Hawaiians wear vegetation is if they have a part of the forest on them, they are more likely to speak the truth. That explains why that whole front line with Martin Luther King are all wearing Hawaiian leis. You know how great it is to be born and raised here and the word prejudice is not even your vocabulary? Do you know how great it is to not to to walk around and not feel that boy, you know, am I whatever? You know how great it is that you don't care what religion you are because it's not a fact of judgment as you as a person? That was Hawaii. Unfortunately, the Hawaiians paid the price also because they were discarded as just not important. But interestingly, what occurred at the same time was the beginning of a cultural renaissance. The Hawaiians, through their elders, were reminded of who they were. And only now, now meaning the past 20, 30 years, a realization of what is total truth. It started with things like the hula, the music, the language. The difference of how a mainlander feels compared to a native, and I won't even say a native Hawaiian, I think it's more people who've been through this a multiple number of times. People who've been living on this island their whole life, they're used to the change, they're used to this volcano now and then acting up and doing this. And somebody who goes this through the first time is in pure panic. A lot of people on the mainland keep asking if we're going to rebuild our house and 
it's hard to explain to them that there is no rebuilding. Well, I think that when you experience the biggest eruption in 200 years, it gives people a reason to become reflective. And I think that we're in a long period of reflection where people have to decide, are we going to rebuild in the areas that should never have been built in before, that really essentially, to put it in Hawaiian language, would be, really was Pele's realm, right on the rift zones. Puna was the fastest growing part of the state of Hawaii, which made realtors and builders really happy. But do we really want to go through this again? There are those who are urging a more conservative approach. Let's not redo these mistakes. And then there are those who are proposing sort of the, uh, what I would call a more radical approach, which is despite what we know about building on rift zones, let's just do it all again. I think it's important for us to distinguish the difference between a natural disaster and a natural disaster that's facilitated by bad planning and politics and economics. The real lesson for the broader world is to develop a more rational, more respectful, more understanding perspective about the power of nature because it might be an eruption here on the Big Island, but it's the same dynamic of bad planning that's leading to the wildfire problems in the west, the hurricanes in Florida and on the east coast, the overdevelopment along the mighty Mississippi River in the floodplain. Over and over and over again, we keep making those same mistakes because we're driven by an economic vision that is no longer rational. We need to embrace nature. We look forward to every day that we have. Um, if she erupts tomorrow, we would mahalo and aloha that for sure. We don't know what Kilauea is going to do next. We don't know what Mauna Loa is going to do next either, and both volcanoes are well within our realm. But wow, what a fascinating time to be here. Watching that volcano, it's, it's like the birth of the Earth. I love it, as, as even though it threatened my home, and I've seen it take a lot of my friends' homes, I still love the volcano. It's, it's um, where we live, what we do. I, I want to live here. This is paradise. This is where I want to live. And I'm not leaving. I feel the same way as the other people. It's, this is my home. You know, you've got hurricanes or earthquakes or tsunamis or floods all over this country right now. Everybody's got something. Ours is a volcano. It's the disaster capital of the world, but we call it paradise.